So thank you for coming, everybody. Uh, tonight we are going to uh, listen to Miss Jane Williamson. She has a master's in historic preservation from UVM. She's formerly a director of the Ropey Museum for more than 20 years. And she's going to speak to us tonight about the Underground Railroad. So with a warm welcome. Thank you. So um, I always ask when I start whether anyone has visited Ropey, and I thought, oh, you won't have to ask. Everybody will have visited Ropey. So I'm going to ask. <laughs> <Yeah>. OK. <laughs> Good. Just what I thought. Um, so I'm talking about the Underground Railroad. Um, I was at Director Ropey for a long time, which gave me ample opportunity to really think about it, read about it, research about it. Um, so this talk is about the Underground Railroad in history and in what some historians call memory, a memory being primarily the oral tradition. So most of what we think we know, we say we know about the Underground Railroad, falls into the realm of memory. Um, and a lot of that actually is, myth is mythology. Um, a few of the Underground Railroad stories that are commonly told all around Vermont, all around the North, in fact, um, really are not backed up by any substantive evidence. Um, and there are a couple of problems with that. One is that by revering the myth so highly, we're in danger of forgetting our truths. And in the case of the Underground Railroad, that often happens. Um, second is that um, the legend of the Underground Railroad often prevents us from understanding really correctly the heroism of the enslaved people who ran from the south to the north. So I'm going to use Ropey as a case study. It's really perfect um, for that because um, it has a, an extremely well documented history on one of the best documented underground railroad sites in the country. And it also has a rich mythology. So it has lots of information and evidence on both sides of this divide. All right. So, oops, never mind. I'm there. That's what we using. I thought I had a title on this. Um, Ropey, you may know, was designated as a National Historic Landmark um, in 1977. And the reason that it was so designated is because of its underground railroad history. Today, we know it as a 90-acre historic site, but from 1793 to 1961, it was home to four generations of the Robinson family. They were a remarkable group of Quaker farmers, abolitionists, artists, and authors. And during the 1830s and 1840s, it was a prosperous sheep farm that provided refuge to quite a number of people fleeing bondage. All right, maybe I'll try this. Rowan Thomas Robinson, who you see here, was born at Ropey in 1796, not too long after his parents had emigrated to Vermont from Newport, Rhode Island. He and his wife, Rachel Gilpin, were devout Quakers and radical abolitionists. Radical abolitionists, that means that Rowland and Rachel believed slavery was a sin, a very serious matter, a sin to be opposed by every acceptable means. And that included offering work and shelter to enslaved African Americans who sought freedom in the North. <clears throat> Oops. There you go. Luckily for us, the Robinsons were also a bunch of pack rats. And if you've been through that house, you've seen some of the pack ratism, who saved, sometimes it seems like, absolutely everything. Um, literally thousands and thousands of letters and documents span the generations. And they help us. They tell us what the abolitionist Robinsons believed, how they put their beliefs into action, and how their efforts were remembered by their children, their grandchildren, and eventually by all of us. So I'm going to start with a document that was created decades after the Underground Railroad had ceased to operate. In 1896, Wilbur H. Siebert sent this questionnaire to the descendants of Rowland Thomas and Rachel Robinson. Siebert was a young professor of history at Ohio State University, and he used this really unusual, this modern and kind of novel approach to gather data for his book on the Underground Railroad, published in 1898, and many people still use it today. 
Now this is 1896. The abolitionist Robinsons had been dead for 20 years and more when Siebert sent this questionnaire off, and it was addressed to their son George Robinson. George was also dead in 1896, so it was answered by their son, their youngest child, Rowland Evans Robinson, oops, yeah, go too many, who was then 63 years old himself. Now, Rowland Evans Robinson is a very important man. He was a naturalist, an author, an artist, and temperamentally, you could say he was sort of the opposite of his parents. He had essentially no interest in their causes. But at this point in his life, when he got this opportunity to record his parents' work, he took it very seriously. He wrote a long, thoughtful, clear, to-the-point response. Rowland Evans had been a child in the 1830s and 1840s, but his detail, his recollections are quite detailed, and they really ring true as you read the letter. He recalled, quote, seeing four fugitives at a time in my father's house, and quite often one or two harboring there. Now his memory of the four was still extremely vivid, because one, he said, quote, carried the first pistols I ever saw, and the other, the first bowie knife. So you can imagine this little boy sees these guys come once armed with pistols. That made a big impression on him. As you read through the letter, his effort to remember and record his experience as clearly as possible is really palpable. You can feel him calling up these memories. And in the course of the letter, he says nothing about concealing fugitives at Ropey, and he mentions that they sometimes stayed for months working on the farm. Siebert, that's Professor Siebert. He returned to this subject. He published his first book in 1898. He returned to the subject 40 years later, and he contacted the Robinsons again in 1935 for another book. This time, he was writing a book specifically about the Underground Railroad in Vermont. But now we are 30 years, it's another generation removed. So this letter was answered by the abolitionist's grandson. His response was brief. His father wrote like a 12 page letter. His is very brief, but it contains an important piece of information in the last line. It says, you can get the book out of bondage in your local library. Published in 1905, out of Bondage was a collection of a dozen or so stories by Rowland Evans Robinson. I told you he was a successful author, very popular here in Vermont. Now, Robinson clearly understood the fiction market of the time, and during the last few years of his life, he published several, several Underground Railroad stories. And they, they're sort of similar. Um, there's an ailing or otherwise compromised runaway in hiding with a Quaker family, either discovered or about to be discovered, and able to elude capture only through the humanitarian and clever efforts of their Yankee benefactors. Now, Siebert obviously went to his library or his bookstore and borrowed a copy of Out of Bondage because he tells you those stories in his history book of Vermont almost verbatim. He presented them as fact. He explained that Robinson, quote, had actually heard most of the anecdotes he published and wrote but he made use of fictitious names for his characters. I, I'm sure Professor Siebert believed that, or he wouldn't have put those stories in his book, but I can tell you that he offered no evidence of it, and there isn't any in the historical record. They were written about the same time, Rowland Evans Robinson's Underground Railroad stories and his response to Siebert, but they're very different. They paint strikingly different pictures. The stories are all like the ones you know. The slave is on the run, the slave catcher is at his heels, they're lurking around every corner, there's great danger. But Robinson's letter suggests that fugitives who found their way to Vermont found quite a bit of safety here. Rowland Evans Robinson died in 1900, and as his generation passed on, his stories, his fiction, uh, was what carried on to inform future generations. They were instrumental, these stories were absolutely instrumental in creating our understanding of the Underground Railroad in Vermont, and especially at Ropey. It's the story that we all know, fugitive slaves took off under cover of darkness and found freedom in Canada, guided by the North Star and aided by sympathetic white northerners. These are popular stories, they're full of daring and altruism, 
with hidden doors and loose floorboards and attic hideaways and lanterns put out. And when people come to Ropeby, that is what they come expecting. That is what they come looking for. Now, until the mid-1980s, that is what they found. Um, visitors were conducted to a small chamber in the oldest part of the house. It's the room through that door. It was dubbed the Ropeby Slave Room in the early years of the 20th century. And everybody knew about the Ropeby Slave Room. So we're going to look at that 1935 letter to Siebert. This is the letter from the last Robinson um, to Siebert. It says, quote, in a chamber of this house, there was in one corner a built-out clothes press, which to persons not knowing the secret looked innocent enough, but we knew the back opened into a room beyond where the slave was kept and where a slave was hiding once when the house was searched by the slave's master and the county sheriff. This is very much like other Underground Railroad stories, and there are many of them in Vermont. I'm sure you, you know a few yourself. This one was widely known, much loved, but there were a few problems with it. The room he mentions, oh, can you see that? It's hard to see it when it isn't fully dark. This, you're standing in the kitchen chamber. The first room you come into, can you see that there's a door here? Oh, you turn the lights up? Yeah. So this is the first room in the upstairs, the kitchen chamber. And this door is where the clothes press would have been put, according to Raleigh. All right. So the idea that if you put a cupboard in front of that door, that the room behind it would disappear is a kind of a fanciful notion. Because the room takes up more than one third of the second floor space. It has three windows and a dormer. So it would be pretty hard for somebody who looked on the outside of the house not to figure out. Furthermore, there's the chimney. The chimney rises up the center. If there wasn't another room, that would mean the chimney was on the end of the house. And we know chimneys don't go on the end in Vermont. They mostly go up the middle. So this is just a typical kind of story where you could say it's the, it represents the triumph of wishful thinking over reason. So this is the view of the Underground Railroad, and it changed dramatically when staff and volunteers began to really examine the museum's phenomenal correspondence collection. The museum holds more than 15,000 letters. They span the decades from 1790 to 1960. They document the site and the family, and they inform all of the interpretation and everything we have to say at the museum. Now, letters to and from Rowland Thomas and Rachel Robinson in the 1830s and 1840s are full of abolition. There is barely a letter during those decades where you aren't going to read something about anti-slavery, the evils of slavery, the necessity of taking action, what the best tactics are. And in the course of all of that, several of these letters document fugitive slaves in quite a bit of detail. Through these letters, we meet Simon and Jesse, John and Martha Williams, Jeremiah Snowden, and several others who remain nameless. These letters brought us a new interpretation of the site and a fresh understanding of how the Underground Railroad actually operated in Vermont. So now we're going to look at a few of those. Letters from abolitionists Oliver Johnson and Charles Marriott tell a new but remarkably consistent story. First, these letters make clear that Vermont was truly a safe haven for those who had escaped from bondage. Oliver, this is Oliver Johnson. He wrote from Western Pennsylvania where he was traveling as an anti-slavery lecturer in 1837. He explained that being very near Maryland, the area, quote, had at all times no small number of runaway slaves, but they are generally caught unless they proceed further north. Johnson was writing to the Robinsons on behalf of one of those runaways, Simon. He said that Simon, quote, had intended going to Canada in the spring, but says he would prefer to stay in the U.S. if he could be safe. I have no doubt he will be perfectly safe with you. Let me say that again. I have no doubt he will be perfectly safe with you. Charles Marriott, sheltering John and Martha Williams, thought it best to send them further north, as he put it, either to you or to Canada. He was weighing the merits of Canada versus Vermont and concluded, quote, 
If they can be taken in by Z, we should think them safer. Among the most fascinating letters uh, in this collection are those that were exchanged in the spring of 1837 between Rowland Thomas Robinson and Ephraim Elliott. Ephraim Elliott was a slave owner in Perquimans County, North Carolina. Robinson wrote on behalf of Jesse, a fugitive sheltered at Ropeby, to negotiate the cost of a freedom paper. Now by sending this letter, what did he do? He revealed Jesse's exact location. What does that tell you? That tells you that Jesse did not consider for one moment that anyone was coming up from North Carolina after him, or he would never have taken that risk. So both he and Robinson obviously didn't think that was going to be a result of sending this letter, and indeed it, it wasn't. Also revealing is Eliot's reply. He admitted that, quote, Jesse's situation at this time places it in his power to give me what he thinks proper. But he went on to name his price at $300, which, he said, quote, is not more than one-third what I could have had for him before he absconded if I had been disposed to sell him. Robinson wrote to present a counteroffer. Quote, since leaving thy service, Jesse has, by his industry and economy, laid up $150. He is willing to give the whole of this sum for his freedom. If Jesse was in possession of a larger sum, he would freely offer it all for his freedom. Robinson urged Elliot to accept Jesse's offer, noting that, quote, considering his present circumstances and location, it must be acknowledged liberal. In other words, he's gone. This is your chance to get some money. Elliot agreed. He conceded that, quote, at this time, Jesse is entirely out of my reach. But he held firm on his price nevertheless. He would not budge off $300. <coughs> now, it's true that Ephraim Elliot is only one slave owner, but he clearly considered the prospect of trying to reclaim the fugitive from Vermont to just be out of the question. It was never even considered. The second clear and consistent message from these letters is that fugitive slaves needed work. Ropey was a large and prosperous sheep farm, <clears throat> and with a small family, the Robinsons could almost always use another hired hand, and if they couldn't, probably a neighbor could. So many of the fugitives who were sent to Ropey were sent there clearly for that reason. The Johnson and Marriott letters read like job references. Um, Oliver Johnson describes uh, Simon. He says, quote, he appeared to me to be an honest, likely man. I was so well pleased with his appearance that I could not help thinking he would be a good man for you to hire. Mr. Griffith says that he is very trustworthy, of a kind disposition, and knows how to do almost all kinds of farm work. He is used to teaming and very good to manage horses. He says that he could be any man in the neighborhood where he lived at mowing, cradling, or pitching. Charles Marriott, wishing to send John and Martha Williams, assured Robinson that John was, quote, a good chopper and farmer, and that his wife Martha was, quote, useful and well-conducted in the house. And Jesse, of course, proposed to pay for his legal freedom with $150 he had saved while working on the farm, a sum that would have taken more than a year to accumulate. Now you can imagine, discovering these letters was a dream. Um, just think of how they have transformed our understanding and interpretation. Instead of stowing fugitives for one night on their way to Canada, the Robinsons welcomed them into their home, hired them to work on their farm, and provided a measure of safety and security in a hostile world. We know that bringing people to life is the key to bringing history to life for our visitors. So in reaching beyond the melodrama to the really more human story, we provide our visitors with a much more complex and meaningful understanding of the real, actual people involved in these events that are often so sensationalized. So at Rokeby, you will find no secret rooms, no slave catchers, no subterfuges, just individuals from vastly, vastly different circumstances 
who, incredibly enough, met. They met across boundaries of geography, of race, law, class, social convention, you name it. This is an interracial story of resistance and of refuge. A story of enslaved African Americans who resisted their own subjugation by risking everything in a run for freedom. And of privileged white Vermonters who also resisted the powerful institution of chattel slavery by offering refuge to those in flight from it. I always like to give the Robinsons the last word. We have so many of their wonderful words. So I'm going to read from one final letter. Rachel Gilpin Robinson sent this letter to an absent family member in 1844. And I think this passage that I'm going to read really hints at the uh, personal concern and the connection that was made that are at the heart of this story. She says, oh, before I forget it, they must be told. We have had two of the fugitive slaves who fled from bondage in a whaleboat and were pursued by an American vessel of war. Noble work. They have gone on to Canada, for they were afraid to remain anywhere within our glorious republic, lest the chain of servitude should again bind soul and limb. They tarried with us only one night, and were very anxious to journey on to Victoria's domain. Poor men, they left wives behind and deeply did they appear to feel the separation. They felt it so keenly. One of them said he would never have come away had he not supposed he could easily effect the escape of his wife also when once away. Both seemed very serious, as though grief sat heavy on their hearts. I will take questions. Would be, uh, hard, would be hard to know. Mostly they didn't know it. Um, I always say if you want to know about the Underground Railroad, you should read some of the fugitive slave narratives. Many of these folks who made it to the North were very successful and published their stories. Um, James Pennington escaped from Maryland around the same time, actually, um, as Simon. And he ultimately became um, a deacon in the Presbyterian Church. I think it was Presbyterian. He left the plantation in Maryland. He thought he knew how to get to Baltimore. He walked in a circle three times. He ended up, oh my God, I'm back at the beginning. That, he did that three times. Can you imagine how discouraged he must have felt? On the fourth try, whatever he was doing wrong, he fixed. So that's just, an, you know, people have this idea that, oh, I'm on the Underground Railroad. And you just whisk up to the north. It's, some people did. Frederick Douglass uh, borrowed a sailor costume and some sailor's papers and got on a train in Baltimore and got off in New York. He did just go choo choo choo. But mostly they walked, mostly it was long and hard. Simon um, was in western Pennsylvania, um, a place I visited and shows you how bad I am on geography. It's very mountainous, western Pennsylvania. It's coal mining country. He was there in December or January. When I was there, the snow drifts were like this. It was January. And the, the wind never stopped. You know, and we had snow plows and paved streets. So imagine him trying to work his way from there, through that snow. That's one reason he stayed the winter. He didn't move. He was planning to start again in spring. So, you know, it was chancy. Um, some people were tricked into coming into a home. They thought they were being aided. And then the, whoever it was called the authorities. And they were picked up and sent home. I'm trying to think, it was, I think it was William Wells Brown. He got sent back, but he escaped again. So it was, it was not easy. And some people got on boats. If you could get on some kind of transportation it would be faster, still you had to stay hid. Um, but it was, they didn't mostly, you know, it wasn't like they had a map. 
Yes. Well, what was the state's official position on on these escape people? Um, well, Vermont was one of the northern states that passed several what were called personal liberty laws. Um, Everybody knows the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, but sometimes people don't know that that was the second Fugitive Slave Act. First of all, the Constitution guarantees slave owners the right to reclaim their lost property. That's in the Constitution. Then in 1793, which is like, what, four years after the Constitution, the first Fugitive Slave Act was passed, saying the same thing. But the northern states, as they got more and more invested and interested in working toward anti-slavery, they started to pass these laws that tried to pick at this. They would say, well, you have to give them a jury trial. Well, you have to show this. Well, you have to show that. They tried within the state to set up tests and efforts and due process and things that it would, would assist any fugitive. Um, in 1842, I think it was 42, it was 42 or 44. The Supreme Court decision called Prig v. Pennsylvania was very important. Um, actually, the states of Maryland and Pennsylvania kind of cooperated in sending this case through to the Supreme Court because Pennsylvania said, sorry, our state laws say the following. You can't come and get this guy. And they said, well, the Constitution and the Congress. So the Supreme Court decided that the Constitution and the Fugitive Slave Law were correct and shot down all of those state laws. That did not stop Vermont. Like within months after the second Fugitive Slave Law being passed in 1850, they passed another one. You know, they just wanted to let the world know what they thought. So uh, if, if, that, if that's the official position of the state of Vermont, under whose authority were the county sheriffs acting? There were no county sheriffs doing anything. I thought I heard you. Yeah, you did, but that's, that never happened. That's the mythology story. Um, there's a report that was done a pretty long time ago now, in the late 90s, called Friends of Freedom. Any of you familiar with Friends of Freedom? Do we still have it on our website? We may have, it may be on the museum's website. If you Google Friends of Freedom, you'll find it. It was on one of the state websites. It, it's a big report on the Underground Railroad in Vermont. Ray Zerblis worked on it for a few years. Um, it's the biggest single thing you can find about Vermont. He never once found any, anybody coming across the border into Vermont to reclaim a fugitive slave. In all the work that we've done at Ropey, we have never found any record of anyone coming across the border of Vermont to reclaim a fugitive slave. So that story about the slave's master and the county sheriff searching the house, no, nobody ever searched the house of Ropey. Nobody ever even thought to search the house of Ropey. Those people never came up to Vermont. I, I shouldn't say that. There is no record of it. It's easy to say there never was. Maybe there was, and the record has just eluded all of us. Yes? Well, I wonder if there's uh, any correspondence in the South about what they've heard about Vermont. You know, like, if you go up to Vermont, they'll kill you or something. You know, they, there might mm. have been a mythology going on in the South concerning what would happen if they went that far north. Yeah, well, maybe. I don't know. Um, I will say there was a, one historian writing a pretty long time ago, it was an older book in the 40s or 50s, and she makes the point that she's talking about northern New England, uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine. If somebody had come all that way and found their person and was trying to go back with them, you have to go back through all of those states. So you might not make it back through all of those states. There are abolitionist mobs formed after the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act in 1850, uh, the federal government was very eager to reclaim the fugitive from Boston. Boston was the center of the abolitionist movement. It's where all the big radicals, everything came out of Boston. So they wanted to, in a way, to embarrass Boston. They wanted to take somebody from Boston. So the first person was named Shadrach Minkins, and they had him in the courthouse. And about 200 people came barreling over, uh, ab white abolitionists, but a whole lot of black Bostonians. They ran up the stairs. They shoved the 
the sheriffs and whomever out of the way. They grabbed the guy, they ran down the stairs, they threw him in the wagon, and they drove away. So they had to try again. They had to keep trying in Boston because these people kept coming out of the woodwork and preventing them. Finally, they got Anthony, oh, I'm blanking his last name. What's Anthony's last name? They had 10,000 militia marching him down the street to a ship. It cost the government like $100,000, Burns, Anthony Burns. So that could happen. I mean, it, it could be tricky. Yes? What did the people do when they got to Vermont? Did they, like, did they set up farms and work and live freely? Yes. Yes. I mean, Jesse, um, we don't have any information about his day-to-day -day life, but what we know is that he worked on that farm. He saved up $150. And in the late 1830s, if you were a farmhand working on a Vermont farm, a likely wage for you would be $120 a year. So $150 is a bit more than that, number one. And number two, it's what he saved. Did he save absolutely every cent he earned? So it tells you that he was there working for a long time. Um, some people came and were passed through quickly. Another, another young man, um, his name was Charles Nelson. He was in uh, Saratoga Springs, and uh, some people there he was able to get away from. He was actually traveling with the people who held him as their property. He was able to be removed from them. A man named Mason Anthony put him in a wagon and drove him to Ropey. Just came straight to Ropey without stop. Rowland convinced Chauncey Knapp to, he was only 16, this young man, so he's still a teenager. He convinced Chauncey Knapp to become the guardian of this young man. Does anyone know Chauncey Knapp? Is that a name that rings a bell with any of you? He was the Secretary of State of Vermont and an abolitionist. And he wrote a letter to Mason Anthony, the man who had brought Charles Nelson to Vermont. And he says in the letter, Charles is sitting with me in my office in the State House now. What does that tell you? The Secretary of State in his office in the State House has a fugitive slave. What does that tell you about Vermont's attitude to this? Welcome. <laughs> or something similar, yes. When did Vermont declare slavery? The Constitution, 1777. 1777. Yes. Um, how about the community in Hinesburg of African Americans? Yeah, those, those, those were mostly it? born free. They were born free? Well, most of them. You know, it's really hard to tell. I think Edward Williams, there's some question about his origin. Um, I think in a later census, when they start to record where you were born, I think it may say later that he was born in Virginia. Uh, you've read Elisa's book, uh, Discovering Black Vermont? Yes. yes. Yeah, I, she, she discusses it. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the Clarks, the Langleys, um, the, uh, the Peterses, I think they were mostly born free in the North. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were mostly accepted in that community oh, also. very much. And very how they much. farmed and how they made money and how they built this and that. It was really yes. impressive. But then, their whole cemetery I know. was lost. And I felt so bad about that. I know. I've been wanting to write to, to Heinsberg and say, what about that? Wouldn't you love to, you know, redo that or something? But I, I had to just clear it out. get to do it, right? Yeah, it's a good job. Yeah. Yes? I'm just curious about the role of the churches of the various religious institutions in the, in the abolitionist movement here in Vermont. Um, well, the abolitionists would tell you that they get a big fat F. Um, the, aboli the radical abolitionists were very religious. I said of Rowland and Rachel that they believed slavery was a sin, and that was true of all the radical abolitionists. They were motivated by very deep Christian beliefs. But it was very um, non-denominational. They were not particularly wedded to any one theology or sect or whatever. They, you know, it, was the, it was the golden rule um, and the Declaration of Independence. That was sort of there too. And um, so they believed slavery was a sin. It was absolutely intolerable. 
and they called for immediate emancipation. That was their watchword, immediate emancipation. That scared a lot of people. And given the way they felt and their motivation from their religious beliefs, they thought all the churches should just fall in line, help them in their work, demand immediate emancipation, because the churches are respected an important influence in the community today, but in the 19th century, it was much, much more so. If the churches had really taken this on, it would have pressed forward much faster. So they were mad. Um, Oliver Johnson, who you saw the picture before, he's a wonderful Vermonter, he was born in Peachum. He wrote a book about the abolitionist movement after it was all over with, and it's just a harangue against the churches. From the first chapter to the last, he was so mad that the churches didn't do their duty as he saw it. Um, some of the churches split. The Wesleyan Methodist Church was started in 1843. They split off from the mainstream Methodist Church because keep in mind in these national denominations, the Baptists and the Methodists in particular, there were a lot of churches in the South. There were slaveholders going to the same church that you were going to in the North. And the Northerners said, we don't break bread with them. We have no communion with them. We do not share their beliefs. So we have to separate, and so they did. Um, I think some of the other churches separated. There would be sometimes in a town what was called the Free Church. It would be a church that had an abolitionist uh, sympathies. <clears throat> and let me call some, yeah. If you were an average Vermonter living back then, let's say you were living in Bristol and Ferrisburg is kind of down the road. Um, would you have any kind of an opinion on that or would you even think about it? What was their reaction to the whole thing? Or well, did this life go on? You, you know, Vermonters have always been big on live and let live, even back then. You might be an abolitionist. A lot of people were. In Addison County, almost every town had a local abolition society, anti-slavery society. So there was a lot of activism. They were the minority. The abolitionists were always in the minority. But by 1840 or so, there were between 10 and 12,000 members of local anti-slavery societies. If there was some new movement that came along today and suddenly had 12,000 members in Vermont, would they have influence? 12,000 people? Even today they would. Um, Rowland Evans Robinson's story, Out of Bondage, while it doesn't really present an accurate picture of slaves escaping in the Underground Railroad, it's a wonderful, wonderful story. If you could get your hands on it, you probably could. Just Google it, I'm sure you can bring it up on your computer. It's well worth a read. He is a good writer. He is very interested in Vermonters. And what you can really see in this story is this range of attitudes and ideas about uh, slavery, and is there a fugitive slave in town, and what's happening. Um, there's diff you know, there are two guys who are the, the villains who are prepared to turn in the fugitive slave for the reward money. Then there are the valiant Quaker family who are trying to protect him. You know. Um, but there's a slave uh, stagecoach driver, and he's in the tavern, and he's chatting. There's all these people talking and arguing, and, you know, the big issue of the day. And he says, oh, I don't know. Owning other people kind of goes again, my brain. <laughs> and I think that's the way Robinson puts it. I think that would be the average Vermonter's attitude. Owning other people kind of goes again, my brain. Right? So you're not going to get out on the picket lines. You're not going to be sending petitions. You're not going to be organizing. But you're also not going to be turning the guy in for the $200 reward. Yes? How many railroad locations have been identified in the state? Well, that, I don't know, lots. Um, if you got Friends of Freedom, um, what Ray did was he went to his Wilbur Siebert's book, the big book, it's a big fat book, um, and he pulled out from there everything that Siebert had identified. I think he went to some other books. I don't, I don't know how he got all the sites. He then tried to validate them. He went through each one trying to see what he could find. And, and the report has long, these long lists at the end. There's text at the front. But he categorized them like A, B, C, D. So the A group, there are very few of them. And they're the ones that are clearly identified, historical documentation from the period. There was obvious these, these were places where 
fugitive slaves were harbored, whether for a night or a month or a year, they were there. Then there's the B list, where you know there's something, but it's not quite clear, and it just kind of goes down from there. In, the, in total, he has hundreds. So, you know, you'd have to look at it and see where you th where you think it, the lines are drawn. Um, but there are there were there, in that there are a lot there. Reporting this one in Millbury. I can't remember what's in Millbury. I don't think he has any in the A list in Millbury. But would the runaway slaves be able to walk during the day? Well, as they as they move north, they got safer and safer and safer. Let's look at the letter from Simon. Simon is over the border into Pennsylvania, not real far. He's in uh, Western in Jenner Township is the name of it. Um, because of the snow in the winter, that afforded him some safety. But he couldn't afford to stay there. And he was headed toward Canada. You know, he was, if he just kept going like another, I don't know, 100 miles, he would have been at Lake Erie. You cross Lake Erie and you're home free. But because he met Oliver Johnson, he switched and went the other way. So the further you go, the more space you put between yourself and the Mason-Dixon line, the less likely someone is coming after you. Um, that's why Vermont, I mean, I guess Vermont is a story of two borders. We are very far from the border with slavery. So far that imagine the cost of traveling from North Carolina all the way to Ferrisburg. It would take weeks. I mean, this is 1837, 1839, 1840. It would take a very long time, and it would cost a lot of money. And these are economic decisions. Slaves were financial assets. You wanted to retrieve your financial asset, but if you spent more than your asset was worth getting it, why would you do it? Then the other border is the one that's just north of us. We're very far from this border. We're very close to that one. So if you got to Vermont, what are the chances that they might be able to spirit that person up over the Canadian border like that and you wouldn't get them? So between those two considerations, coming to Vermont just didn't make a lot of sense financially or otherwise. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, to um, follow up a little bit on my question about um, the religious organizations. Yes. Um, um, I'm familiar with the, the denomination of Unitarian Universalism, which is a merger of the two, Unitarians right. and Universalists. Mm -hmm. And um, the state of Vermont had only, and they merged in 1961 or something. The state of Vermont had only two Unitarian churches. That was the big urban um, uh, Montpelier and Burlington. That's it. The rest was Universalist, and there yeah. were over a hundred. And um, uh, on record, the Unitarians never came out against abolition uh, or in favor of abolition against slavery. On record, the Universalists did. The Unitarians um, were based in Boston, and they. A lot of the members of their churches were the mill owners ah, in Boston. Yeah. And so the ministers, first, the individually, they might have been abolitionists, but they, they were cowards and would not go against the big money in their churches. Um, the Universalists, on the other hand, they were the ordinary working people. Right. They were the Vermonters. You right. know, the, um, right. Hosea Ballou was the leader of Universalism in right. the 1800s, and he... Um, served like in Barnard and that whole area. Was he non-existent? Excuse me? Was he non-existent? I, I, I don't know. I think I, he I might have been non-existent. I don't know much about the Universalists, to tell you the truth. Um, the, there's not much, there's no mention, really, of any of them in, in anything we have at Ropeby. Um, but you're right. It, uh, the, the, the ranks were just the average from working Vermonter, the farmers. I mean, farmers are... You know, some of them, certainly Rowland Robinson, he was wealthy. He had a huge marina sheep farm. Um, but not all of them were. So they weren't, they weren't particularly the fancy people. And of course, the mill owners had, the cotton mill owners, had a great financial stake. There was a, an exhibition in um, Rhode Island a pretty long time ago called Lords of the Lash and Lords of the Loom, and how these men the lash bearers in the south and the loom owners in the north had this connection. Um, so it was against their financial interests to get too involved. 
But I can tell you, a lot of people think about the Quakers, and the Robinsons were Quakers, because the Quakers were the first organized religion to officially bar slave owning. They dithered about this over decades in the 18th century, and finally they did it first here and then here, and it kind of went, moved around fairly quickly. By the 1770s, if you were a fewer member of the Religious Society of Friends, you could not own slaves. You would be disowned, which means excommunicated. However, they weren't abolitionists. They didn't take a lot of action. And Rowland and Rachel resigned their membership as friends in 1846 out of frustration because they couldn't get the New York Yearly Meeting to do anything. It just, we're against slavery. Okay, do something about it. Oh, no, 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 no. We, no, we can't, we can't uh, bring disunity or discord on the society. Oh, no, we can't do that. Oh, no, we can't do that. They're very conservative in their activism. So they left. Yes, Jane. Just a couple of days ago, Howard Coffin was on Across the Fence. Did Ooh. anybody see him? Yes. Oh, yes, he did. talked about the blacks in Vermont who joined up. Is this the, the 54th? Yeah, and there were several other um, groups that they were, were with, but he said there were around 700 blacks in Vermont, I believe, I got my numbers right, and he said that 15% um, of them joined up, where with the whites in Vermont, only 11% joined up. Yeah. But um, I was just amazed that so many um, from here, yeah, but joined up with different groups, and some of them were with the fifth group. Yeah, There's, there were a lot of black Vermonters who went into that war. I mean, insofar as there, were, there weren't a lot of black Vermonters in the first place, but of the Vermonters, black Vermonters that there were. So, I just thought it was interesting. Yeah. Are we done? Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Now, I have to do my commercial for the museum. <laughs> I know most of you have been, but some of you, a long time ago, if you haven't been to our new building, it's six years now since it's been opened. It has a really wonderful, large, 2,500 square foot exhibition about the Underground Railroad where you will, could spend a lot of time. And there's some interesting media. We have a little play. It's very wonderful. But we just opened on Sunday a changing exhibit in our downstairs gallery. It's called The Fabric of Emancipation. It's eight pieces of needle-based art. Um, it was curated, which is on loan to us. It was curated by an organization called Harlem Needle Arts. And it's eight African-American artists who use fabric and thread and all kinds of fabric and thready stuff. I don't know what it all is. And it's really a stunner. It's a great exhibition. And it's, you know, your, to me, your only chance ever to see it. So you should try to. Stop by this summer, yes. And you should go on Pi Day. Oh, and you should go on Pi Day, of course! <laughs> August 12th, August right? 12th, right. Pi Day. From Pie one day. to four, there will be 50 or 60 homemade pies in the backyard. So you get to see the museum, go through the new exhibition, eat a bunch of pie, listen to some great music, sit in the shade. What more could you ask for? So thank you all for coming. Thank you.